Hello, everyone. I hope you are doing well, staying apart while keeping together. I am Sarah Conley, the Conservation Coordinator for the International Elephant Foundation. Our next guest for our Ask a Conservationist series is Dr. Bruce Schulte. Dr. Schulte is the Associate Vice President for Strategy, Performance, and Accountability and a University Distinguished Professor at Western Kentucky University. He was the head of Western Kentucky University's biology department for 10 years and has been studying elephant chemical communication and conservation behavior for the past 26 years. He serves as an IEF advisor and for the past three years, IEF has provided support for his Elephants and Sustainable Agriculture project. We are so happy to have him on our team and so excited to interview him today. Welcome, Dr. Schulte. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thanks to everyone. I hope everyone's staying safe and uh, making the best of our current situation. Thank you, absolutely. So since you have such a long history in conservation and elephants, I thought we'd start at the beginning. As a child, did you actually want to be a conservationist? Did you want to be a professor? What, what were your plans? How did, how did you come to this place in life? Well, I, I'm one of those that uh, I've actually gotten pretty close to where I wanted to be, but not exactly um, doing what I thought I would be doing. So my hero growing up was Jacques Cousteau. And I watched all his films. And I grew up in upstate New York with no ocean nearby. So where that came from, I don't really know. Um, but he was my hero. And uh, I went to the College of William & Mary to pursue a biology degree. But also, it was far enough away from home and close enough to an ocean, but not too far away. So in case I change my mind and need to get home or something. Um, and then I went on to graduate school, which was supposed to be a doctor at the University of Southern California to pursue marine biology. And that's what I actually did. I dove all over the world and studied coral reef biology. And um, eventually what happened is our funding did not, uh, was not of the type. We were working with the government in India and I couldn't uh, get all the work done on the funding we had. So I stopped with my master's. But up until I was in my early the 20s, I was on the track to be a marine biologist and work in that world. And things changed a little. See, that just goes to show how any conservation work or any sort of awareness of ecology can lead you to, to something new. I mean, Jacques Cousteau led you to elephants. Exactly. And uh, it was an interesting road because when I studied my master's work, my first try to PhD, I did a lot of chemical communication with marine invertebrates, sponges and uh, soft corals and things like that. And uh, took a break and went and worked at a four year round resort in upstate New York and wrangled horses and did all sorts of other things. And uh, wound up taking my mom to the airport one day in Syracuse, New York and stopped in at the environmental school there and talk to them about possible PhD programs. And one of the gentlemen said, you need to come down the hall and talk to this, one of our professors. And his name was Dietland mueller Schwartze, And he was a student of Conrad Lorenz when he got his PhD, who's one of the founders of the field of ethology or the study of behavior, is a Nobel laureate. So this gentleman, Dr. Dietland, uh, had a doctoral um, grant from the National Science Foundation to hire a doctoral student working on North American beavers and their chemical communication. And so that's what led me into mammalian chemical signaling. And uh, that was just one step away from elephants. When I got done with my PhD, I said, uh, there's a woman out in Oregon who does great work with elephants studying chemical communication. You should go visit her. So my wife and I did. And we, that's how we met Bas, Betts Rasmussen, who's no longer with us, but is one of the predominant uh, ecologists, chemical ecologists in the world at the time and, and studied elephants. And that's how I got into elephants. That's fascinating. It is amazing how many people Betts has inspired to work with elephants and elephant research. I did not know that, that's great. Uh, so, because you are so active in research, but you also have very many, obviously, important obligations at the university, how do you juggle, juggle your role as a professor and your work at the university and your working in the field? 
It's always a challenge, and I was not one of those. I've, many friends who at some point in the career said, I'm going to go to Asia, and I'm going to go to Africa, and I'm just going to live there. And, and what happened to me was uh, when I went to get my work with Betts in the postdoc, we were pregnant. And so um, my first child, our first child was born out in Oregon where Betts was. And I knew at that point that I was not, suddenly not going to take a newborn and, and my wife and move to Asia or move to Africa. Uh, and so that's when I got my first job at um, Providence College in Rhode Island. We moved all the way back across the country from Oregon to Rhode Island. And at that point, I had to figure out, well, how do you do this? How do you stay involved? And so fortunately, there was a zoo uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, Roger Williams Park Zoo, had three African elephant females, and that allowed me to stay involved with elephants uh, and get undergraduate students involved, and it was right in the town we lived in. So 20-minute drive, and you were working with elephants. And so that was phenomenal. A wonderful zoo, wonderful keepers uh, and, and staff of all types at that zoo, and the elephants were wonderful. And so that kept me involved in elephants. And then Bats9, eventually Tom Goodwin, started expanding into doing more work with more zoos across the whole country. And then I met people like Bill Langbauer, who had worked, worked in zoos, but also worked in the field, and uh, eventually was able to, to hook. But the way collaboration um, with friends, with, with new colleagues that you meet, and students really allow you to bridge that chasm, if you will, of teaching and being at home with your family and getting field work done. And again, the field can be a, a zoological institution. It can be a elephants or at a circus. We did a lot of work with Ringling for many, many years, and they were wonderful. And going to the field, all of those, you know, allow you to get some important data and understand elephants better. That's incredible. So it, it sounds like the important denominator is access to elephants and a good team to keep everything going. That's fantastic. And a testament to the collaborative nature of the elephant world, which is wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit more about your early work with elephants? What kinds of things you were studying? What kind of things you investigated? So when I worked with Betts, she was uh, deep in, in gallons and gallons of elephant pee. And she was trying to find pheromones. And the first pheromone that she discovered was the estrus pheromone in Asian elephants, Z7 duodecimal acetate, which is also a part of the pheromone of over 120 species of butterflies and moths, lepidopterans. And so what happened was uh, we were doing a lot of chemical signaling work. I was working with Asian elephants primarily at that time. And then when I got the opportunity to have a job in Rhode Island and there were African elephants, what we decided as a team was that I would sort of take up the African front and she would keep the Asian front going and we would stay collaborating. And so a lot of, oh, the next 10 years for me was involved in zoos, collecting, having uh, keepers help us collect urine, doing bioassays at zoos, doing must exudates and looking for signals in, in, in must secretions from the temporal gland and as well as their urine, doing a lot, a lot of work in, in zoological institutions, uh, working with bats, meeting her down, down in Florida, meeting her at different zoos and things like that, going out to the Riddle Sanctuary in Arkansas, working there, teaching at the school there that they used to hold. So doing a lot of things like that, getting involved early with EMA, with IEF, the Elephant Managers Association, the International Elephant Foundation, doing all these things to create, a, a, again, as you said, a, a team of people. And so, but it was really based strongly on chemical signaling and social behavior. That was the early focus. So that chemical signaling and social behavior, what has that led to? Or did you, did you change tracks a little bit once you stopped working with vets? We, we got a grant through the National Science Foundation. I had then moved to uh, Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia. They had master's programs, so I now could have a master's students working with me. And we got this grant to go to work in Africa, as well as continue to do work with um, zoological institutions. And so we started off in South Africa and worked at Addo Elephant National Park for about 10 years. And that's a, a fence population of known elephants. And White House had helped uh, identify a lot of those elephants and name them. 
and uh, Graham Curley uh, at the university there in, in uh, South Africa near Addo was a professor who was also working on the elephants there. So created those collaborations. And what we wanted to do is see if what we were seeing in captivity was happening in the wild. And so then I had a student who had worked in Tanzania as an undergraduate. We were able to set up a field site up there. So now we had a, a population in South Africa that was contained, very large park, but still contained. And then a transitory population up in Tanzania that was coming through doing their migratory route. So we can now compare captive elephants to wild elephants in a contained situation versus wild elephants in a mobile situation, an unfenced population. And what we are seeing is a lot of the same behaviors, a lot of the same responses to, to odors and social behavior aspects, um, despite a lot of the differences that you get when you put animals in captivity and all that. But that's what first started connecting me to, there's even a bigger issue here, is that these elephants create a lot of benefit for their environment as ecosystem engineers, but they also create a lot of problems for the people that try to live with them. And I realized that I can't just do science, pure science with these animals, because in order to keep these animals around, we have to help the people who are trying to live with them. And so we always knew that from the zoological work, you know, people come to zoos and they, they get informed and zoos do a great job at conservation. But when we went to the field, we saw a whole different type of people involved. These were not people that were coming to a place because they loved elephants like you get in North American zoos. These are people that are trying to survive having to live with elephants, who in many cases would prefer not to live with elephants. And so that put a whole different spin on our research and our approach. You're right. That's something that I think the general public does not necessarily realize that unlike us who can choose to go see an elephant and marvel, those who have to share their landscape don't necessarily have that same emotional reaction because it is a threat and it is, like you said, something they would maybe choose not to have access to or to share their space with. So I think that brings us to your current work or your current project, uh, the Elephants and Sustainable Agriculture. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about what you're researching there and the connections that you're making, the human aspects that you're focusing on? Sure, um, thank you for the question. So I, I had moved from Georgia Southern University up to my current university, Western Kentucky University here in Bowling Green, Kentucky, Become, became department head met other researchers, including a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Stokes in the biology department, who was already doing work in Africa, doing things with wildlife conflict, not necessarily elephants. Um, and then we got involved in a Gates Foundation, National Science Foundation project, in which Gates was looking for creative ways to help feed um, people in Africa. And we knew that crop depredation by wildlife was a huge problem and not just elephants, but clearly elephants are a major cause. So we received um, funding from that combination of organizations to do some work with human wildlife conflict in um, Kenya and in South Africa. And Mike had had a student, a Kenyan gentleman, Simon Kasaini, who did his master's and I was on his committee. And he had uh, subsequently gone back to Kenya and work for a company known as Wildlife Works, which is a carbon trading, an RED, the plus plus carbon trading company uh, operates around the world. Well, they had a, a base of operations in Southern Kenya, near Sabo East and Sabo West. So through these, again, collaborations, students, connections, uh, we were able to set this current project up in this field site uh, that has had, uh, this is where the lines of Sabo uh, had been studied through an Earthwatch project. So a, a popular area for, for uh, doing research, but we were working outside the park. And one of the things that Simon did in his master's and other people have subsequently shown as well, is that elephants use parks because they're protected, they have food, um, they're safe places to be, but the parks don't always provide everything they need. So they'll go out and leave parks. So people who try to live near a national park in places like Southern Africa, uh, 
sub-Saharan Africa are going to be more likely to run into wildlife problems than people that say live closer to an urban area. And of course the people living near those parks typically real, have their lifestyle relies on farming. So they are growing the food that this wildlife would love to come eat. Um, and that creates a problem. And so that set the stage for us to go, okay, we know something about elephant biology. We know something about elephant so social uh, behavior, their chemical communication, other forms of communication. Now we have to connect to how do we get people who are trying to make a livelihood here who have to deal with elephants and other animals coming into their crops? And how do we resolve that? And so it became a sort of, if you will, a two-pronged aspect. One is helping people understand both the benefits and the negatives of elephants. Of course, they already understood some of the negatives, um, but they didn't always understand the why of the negatives. And so uh, we had to work on the people on that side while also trying to understand what are the dynamics that were telling the elephants to leave the park and go find the crops. And that became sort of the crux of the project. It really is the sort of multidisciplinary approach of habitat quality, elephant behavior, human interaction and, and community. It's, it's a broad range approach to trying to study and ultimately solve that problem or find workable solutions. Yeah, exactly. And you know, there's lots of people now working in this area. We're very fortunate to be an area where Save the Elephants started by Ian Douglas Hamilton, who I've known for a long time, George Wittemeyer, uh, who's another excellent biologist, Lucy King and the Beehive Project, they, they have study sites right in the same area, so we've been able to collaborate with them, think about how our ideas can work together. Um, and, and that's the beautiful thing, as you mentioned previously, is that people who are doing this for the right reasons, they're doing it because they want elephants around, and they're doing it because there's no way you can have elephants around if the local people don't want them there as well. If the local people say, forget it, we're done with elephants, it doesn't really matter what you do unless you, again, fence them off. Um, but to have wild elephants, mobile elephants in that area, the only way you're going to do that is for people can, who can survive alongside them. So you have to help both. That's a great point, is that you can't divorce the animals from the humans. It, they go hand in hand to find a sustainable solution, which... I guess brings us to the actual name of your project, Elephants and Sustainability. I think a lot of what you're talking about is finding sustainable solutions, not just stepping in and saying, here, do X, Y, Z for six months, and then as soon as the project funds go away, the progress goes away. Exactly. So let me just tell you a little bit more detail about the project itself. Um, we have a area that wildlife works uh, sort of leases that is a, a wild area. And the, the reason wildlife works, one of the reasons they're interested in this is because carbon trading means that you need places with trees or other forms of plant life that will take up carbon dioxide and help reduce uh, the impacts humans have on global climate. And so this area is a wild area, but it's unfenced. So elephants can move from Savo, which is not fenced, uh, into this area, but they can also move from this area into villages that surround these areas. And so we have act and said it, we need to understand the elephant movements. We need to try to identify some of those elephants because there's been work done that suggests certain elephants are more likely to cause problems than others. So it gets down to that individual level, not just the whole herd, but who in the herd, males, young males, old males, females, females with calves, without calves, who is it that's causing the issue in this area? And then with the farmers, we wanted to deal with the farmers who are right on the front line, close as possible to that wild area, because that's where the elephants are gonna come first. And so we leased cropland from them so that they would help grow it the way they grow it. And we tried different types of fences. And Simon, who I mentioned before, actually designed one of these fences, which is named after him, but it's basically a metal strip fence. You take sort of uh, metal that you'd put on a, a tin roof type of thing and cut it into six to eight inch long strips, maybe an inch or two wide, punch a hole in the top, 
hanging on a wire and put three of those strips or four of those strips together so they kind of bang together a little bit when the wind blows or something rocks them. They're a little sharp on the edges and they reflect sunlight and moonlight. So they provide this, what they call a multimodal, a multi-sensory stimulus to the elephants that says, maybe you don't want to go here. This might not be the best place for you. But we've also tried other things like chili pepper fences, which have been used lots of places, and in working with Lucy beehive fences. So what we're trying to do is give the farmers, one, a way to try to keep elephants out of their field using what's known as deterrent fences. We're trying to understand what elephants might be causing the problem. So that's the second aspect of it. And then a third is we're trying to figure out if there are environmental variables that might give us an idea when elephants are more or less likely to crop rate. Now we already know that they're not going to crop rate if there's no crops on the ground. And they're more likely to crop raid when there's crops are getting close to harvest because that's when they're richest. But they don't do it every time and they don't do it every place. So what are the local conditions that might be more predictive that don't require a lot of technology? They don't require a bunch of cameras or trip wires or drones. There's a lot of nice technology out there, but most of these people can't afford it. So we're looking at things like what wildlife, what birds and mammals that are mobile are around? Are they, do they tend to be eating the same thing? Like for instance, if the wild habitat's not very good, do we see certain ones of those species? Do we not see certain ones of those species? We're also keeping track of the damage the elephants do to the trees. Now this is damage to us, to elephants, it's just elephants feeding on the trees. But we know they like certain types of trees, and we look at how much is done because it's possible that when the trees are getting really beat up by the elephants, that they're low on food and they may be more motivated to come into the crops. So we're trying to use some things that these people who go out into their wildlands all the time, they're very good naturalists, they could observe this if we can point them to what to look for. That might give them some warning like, this is gonna be a bad year for elephants. And they have two growing seasons, because they have wet and dry seasons there, so it's, they don't get snow, fortunately, but they get wet and dry. Um, so they can start looking for these in advance. So those are kind of the biological side. And then the, the fifth part of the components, we've got the trees, the, the birds and mammals, ID and the elephants, the deterrent fences. And then the fifth leg of it is how are they actually growing their crops? And so we're trying to build in sustainable agricultural practices that allow them to make the most of their quality of their soil, of the little bit of rain they get, and the use of multi, growing multiple types of plants together rather than monocultures so that the different plants can help each other with the nutrients in the soils, with shading, and also prevent any one animal from going through and say, oh, I really like corn and all there is is corn. As far as the eye can see, there goes all the corn. But if it's mixed in, they may not always stay there. So it's kind of a five-pronged project that's using sustainable agricultural practices with what we understand about biology and training of, of uh, villagers to understand this information. So that's sort of a six component, if you will, um, to bring this all together for a long term. So as you said, when we leave, they can do this on their own. Exactly. And it sounds like citizen naturalists and community cooperation are an essential ingredient to this. Yeah, and so, so you bring up another aspect of our project. Not only are we collaborating with other elephant researchers, with the local people, with Wildlife Works and their scientists, but we also work with Earthwatch Institute. And what they do is provide a program for volunteers to come from anywhere in the world and work on projects, all sorts of projects around the world. And we're fortunate enough to have been funded for the, by them for several years. We'd have excellent teams come out and people, including some people that have, have worked in zoos in North America have come, um, come out and help us work on the project. And so they do every aspect of all the things I just talked about. They help us collect data on elephants and on crop rating, on the trees, on the wildlife. They go to schools with us. So they see what the children are learning and, and we try to help educate the children. So they've been a, an integral part of this. And then the, one of the real benefits is that they go back to the whatever country they're from, United States, England, 
you know, all parts of Europe. Um, and they transmit this information to their friends and it spreads the word of the benefits of elephants and the benefits of people and how they work together um, for mutual survival. So that's, that's what the real, it's just really a wonderful program. That's an extremely valuable outcome because you work with obviously a lot of people in Africa and people globally through Earthwatch and then your students at the university who are roughly the same age, I would imagine, as some of the people you work with in Africa. How, how are these different global approaches, how are they different? How are they similar? Do they, do certain people better understand these concepts than others? Uh, and how do you get them to be more involved in a beneficial way? One of the things is that with any, anything you're trying to do in life, right, you have to have a vested interest. Uh, it, most of us don't learn if we have to take a course because someone says well this would just benefit you you should take this class because you'll just be a better person for us if we're not interested in that subject we're not interested in that movie and reading that book we're not going to get anything out of it um so and and we may not be interested at first but if we gain the interest then we will get something out of it so it's not always we know we're interested at the start so the first thing you have to do is is get everybody to understand what their potential role is in the eventual solution. And what, what is their interest? Why are they there? So the farmers want to grow their crops. They want to have their families. You know, someone might be going, hey, I'm going to vacation in Africa, and I just want to do something that's helpful. But they may not be that really targeted on you know, elephant conservation or human-wildlife conflict per se. So when you get them involved and you get them on the ground and actually working together, um, trying to learn a few words of Swahili, uh, eating the foods that the local people eat, um, trying to give up the internet for a few days, you know, things like that, um, you start to bring and find the commonalities and that people ultimately are not all that different. And things like this big guy behind me, most people will go, pretty gorgeous animal, pretty much worth having around. Um, so what can we do to have both our families and our food and our livelihoods and live here and keep some of these animals around? Um, and you find that common ground and that allows you to move forward. And the other thing that we always try to do in our projects is we're open to the ideas of everyone who gets involved. Um, you know, we never know what the next great idea is going to be to help solve the, whatever problem, including the COVID one, right? So um, you got to be open to other people's ideas and never think that you've got all the answers. Very true. And your project is a testament to that with the novel fence idea that Simon Cassine developed. Mm -hmm. Based on all of that, how would you go about getting young people involved or interested in following your footsteps? People have to obviously blaze their own trail in life. And what you're, what you're looking for is, I think, inspiration. What is it that turns me on uh, just the same way I did with Jacques Cousteau? What, what is it about what he was doing that made me want to don a wetsuit and go dive underwater when I grew up with no ocean in sight? You know? um, and so what you're trying to do for people is say, you really can make a difference as an individual. And you never know what, how you're gonna to touch someone's lives at the time. You just have to go forward and do your best and do it for good reasons with good intentions and hope that other people see it that way and then follow and bring their own innovations and their own angle you know, to the story. But uh, I think if you, if you try to jam it down somebody's throat and say, you should do this, you know, um, it, it doesn't work. I, my wife and I have been vegetarians for 25 years or more, but we don't preach vegetarianism to other people. It's not, we did it for our own reasons and we do it and we set an example for it, but it's not for everybody. Um, and it's the same way when you do research, you sit back and go, I'm doing this for these reasons. This is my motivation. I hope you can at least appreciate it, even if you don't want to do it yourself, but find your way of making the world a better place and take that same intensity 
and desire and willingness to learn to whatever you do. That's a very smart approach. And I think a, to hearken back to the theme, a more sustainable approach to getting people to, to buy into making long-term changes and to making an investment for, for conservation and ecology. Since you probably aren't going to go back to your field site anytime soon, given the global pandemic, have you heard from the people that you work with there? What, what kinds of things are they dealing with right now? Uh, how are they coping with the effects of COVID-19? Yeah, so we do, we keep in good touch with our field team. Obviously we have to keep them updated as to what's happening as well in terms of you know, funding and travel and all that for us. Um, yeah, right now, you know, we can't go, even if we wanted to go. We, our university has a travel hold and things like that. Kenya's being very cautious, which is good. They do have, you know, several hundred cases in Kenya. There's, I think today or yesterday, 22,500 cases across Africa. South Africa's got quite a few. Egypt's got quite a few. So it's it's all around. It, it's, it doesn't miss anybody. Uh, Everybody has the potential. So that obviously becomes the first thing is stay safe. Um, the elephants, probably like wildlife as we're reading about all over the planet are kind of liking this break from people having to stay home a bit. So, <laughs> so there's a rosy side to it as well, right? Um, but you know, the people in the villages, they still have to go out and take care of their crops. They can't go to the grocery store or order online and just drive down and pick it up. So we want to try to stay as involved as possible and we're very fortunate that the team at wildlife works that's there right now they're still able to go out they're still able to talk to the farmers um, they're not supposed to gather in large groups like the rest of us but they're still able to interact we still have our uh, deterrent plot fields our experimental fields set up we have our camera traps they're growing crops we're going to through IES help channel some funds to them so that they can keep that going even if we can't be there for the first growing season, which is starting now and, and will happen over the next three, four months. Um, so they're, they're, playing, they're being safe, uh, they're taking care of themselves, and they're also able to still do some work. And we'll just have to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis as to how much they can do. Um, but you know, in the end, we've got to keep in mind that people still need to grow food and, and we think about it in North America, thank goodness our own farmers and stuff are still out there working and stuff um, because otherwise there'd be nothing to go get at the grocery store. And so we can't forget them. They're, those people are doing a tremendous job just trying to live from day to day. And fortunately, I don't think the pandemic has really reached the outer rural villages uh, or else we just don't know about it yet, which is always concerned with COVID, right? Um, but so far, everybody's healthy, happy, safe and we're inching the project along as best we can. Well, that's good news. That is something to hang some hope on. Uh, and yes. you're right. We are absolutely indebted and lucky to everyone, lucky for everyone out there who's doing just heroic work to keep our food supply going and to keep all of our resources going that we need. Um, and in the field, they don't have those luxuries. So it, it is definitely something to consider. Um, so every little thing that they're able to get done during this is, is a gift. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you would love to bring up? Things that people don't know about elephants or that you would like to share or highlight? I think uh, one thing, people increasingly are more and more aware of, of elephants because they get a lot of press and they get a lot of uh, specials on them and everything else. And one of the things, they're a, they're a wonderful, magnificent animal. They're elephants, they're not people. And sometimes what we tend to do with this, these uh, charismatic megafauna is we wanna put a lot of human attributes onto our animals. And that's fine, it helps us connect with them, it helps, we'd like to do it with our dog and our cat and everything else, but they live in a world that we can't quite imagine. Their sense of smell is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, as far as we know today, they smell better than any other mammal we know of, uh, their ability to detect odors. So when they're walking around like, like the guy in the picture here, um, they are experiencing their world very differently than we do. And that's a fascinating thing. 
And I think if we can remember that, even as you go outside and you watch your birds flying around, whether they're pigeons in a city or, you know, cardinals like the ones out on my property here, um, birds, mammals, insects, butterflies, whatever you like, they're experiencing the world in their way. And if we can appreciate their way, we're more likely to save the planet the way every species can enjoy it and, and survive in it rather than just the way we like it. Um, and I think that's really important. And so I think elephants are a great ambassador for really helping to save their environment because they treat it very differently than we would treat it. Um, and they perceive it very differently than we perceive it. But it's fascinating how they do. Very wise words. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, I think we are just about wrapped up. Thank you for your time. Thank make you. sure you uh, make sure we stay safe. Make sure you are healthy and your family's healthy. Um, and hopefully, we'll we will get you back into the field soon. Well, thank you, and, and please, uh, once again, International Elm Foundation is just a wonderful organization. They've been around a long time. I hope you're around for a lot longer, and I, I hope people are willing to support IEF and keep the great work going, not just mine, but all the projects that you support, both uh, in, with captive animals and wild animals, with Africans and ele elephants and Asian elephants and forest elephants. It's just a great group, and really appreciate you, you keeping it going through these difficult times. Thank you so much. We, we appreciate your involvement for, through all these years and we're loving the work you're doing. So we are excited to see everything continue. Thank you so much, Bruce.